right. Hello, everyone. Come in to the virtual uh, Institute for Public Knowledge uh, at New York University. We're super excited to have you back. Take your time, settle in, sit down. I hope you've had a good morning or day so far, depending on where you are based. Um, I am super, super thrilled to welcome you all back to the Co-opting AI series. I hope you had a good start into this new year. I'm Dr. Mona Sloan. I'm a sociologist at New York University, and I study how technology, design, and society intersect. I'm based at the NYU Tennis School of Engineering, where I'm a research assistant professor and a senior research scientist at the Center for Responsible AI. And I have for quite a long time now been a fellow here at NYU's Institute for Public Knowledge, um, where we started the series in pre-pandemic time, 2019. Um, as per usual, a huge and heartfelt thanks to our very generous supporters here at NYU, of course, the Institute for Public Knowledge, the 370J Project, the NYU Center for Responsible AI, and the Department of Technology, Culture, and Society. Thank you for your ongoing support of the series. Now, with today's conversation, we are turning to a topic that I'm quite fond of myself and do a fair bit of research on AI and recruiting. Um, and in the conversation that follows today, uh, we will examine how artificial intelligence intersects with the profession of recruiting and how this technology mitigates the process of gaining and sustaining access to the labor market, which is a big deal. Um, concretely, we'll try to connect kind of current scholarship and thinking in the policy space with kind of very deep and very applied industry insights in uh, on the tech, uh, HR tech sector specifically. But before we start that conversation um, and um, kind of delve into these topics, I want to acknowledge that I'm standing on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples, and I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community and the indigenous communities, perhaps on whose land you may be located or standing right now, and to commit to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism in our institutions and the academy in particular. Now, Recruiting. I think we can all agree that recruiting is a high stakes situation, whether or not we get added to the slate of candidates that rec recruiters present to their hiring managers or their clients can really have a massive effect on access to career opportunities, on our livelihoods, on our economic uh, mobility. And so recruiters ultimately are part of a relatively powerful group of people who uh, participate in gatekeeping access to the labor market. Now, if we add automation to this scenario, we can today see that there are various kinds of technologies that sort of help recruiters with that. Not few of them are quote unquote AI driven. For example, we have automated resume screeners and candidate rankers. We have natural language processing tools that help recruiters write more inclusive job descriptions. We have targeted job advertising. Um, we have AI-driven job and talent search platforms, video interviewing software, personality testing, all sorts of things. Um, all of this is big business. Um, I did a little research on that and I found that the um, global market of AI-driven tools used in recruiting is expected to grow to $695 million by 2026. Now, of course, we also have increasing evidence that these tools can exacerbate discrimination, causing regulators to worry specifically about the use of AI in hiring and employment. In the US, that happens primarily on a local level. We have a bunch of local laws that are addressing that. We also have regulation across the pond in the EU that we expect it to kick in. This year, the EU AI Act that classifies hiring AI as a quote-unquote high-risk AI application. So there's a lot going on. And so recruiting is an incredibly productive 
no pun intended, arena for exploring the issues that we're interested in around technology, society, the economy, and regulation. And today, I'm so thrilled. I am fortunate enough to have three terrific experts on the topic with me today. Dr. Foma Juna, Chad Sobash, and Joel Cheeseman. Um, please wave. Hello. Um, Dr. Foma Juna is an associate professor of law with tenure at UNC School of Law, where she also is the founding director of the AI Decision-Making Research Program. She has been faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard Law School since 2017. Her research focuses on race and the law, law and technology, and importantly, employment and labor law. Her work has been widely published in very many high-impact journals, among them the California Law Review, Cardozo Law Review, Fordham Law Review, and many more. Um, she also is an avid public scholar. She has op-eds out with the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and so on. She has testified before the U.S. Congressional Committee on Education and Labor and has spoken before governmental agencies such as the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And she also has a forthcoming book called The Quantified Worker, Law and Technology in the Modern Workplace, which I'm also very excited about. Now, my other two guests are kind of come together, uh, Joel Cheeseman and <laughs> Chad <laughs> Savage. Joel God. Cheeseman is a recruiting <laughs> industry tech geek, his words, not mine, uh, from the late 90s when he worked at Eastman, one of the world's first job boards, as well as job options, career board, jobbing and recruiting.com. He also did partnership <laughs> stuff <laughs> at Employee Screening IQ, um, but you probably know him from his days as Cheese Ad. Um, Joe likes to tinker, which means he has started a variety of businesses, and his uh, latest venture is a market sentiment platform called Poach. He is the co-founder of the Chet and Cheese podcast, which is um, the thing the two do together. Um, and Joel does this together with Chad Sovash. Chad, if you could wave to um, say hello. Um, hello. Chad has actually worked, hello, in the HR talent acquisition and HR tech space for over 20 years, consulting hundreds of Fortune 500 companies. Um, he is a former Army infantry drill surgeon who cut his teeth in online recruitment in 98 with an outfit called Online Career Center before it launched in 99 as monster.com. So it's been around for a while. Um, he went on to build startup Direct Employers Association, steer recruit military um, toward uh, revenue as CXO, and built Ronstedt's, which is a big um, agency's uh, first military veteran hiring program. Um, he is also a professional podcaster today um, and is uh, doing the Chat and Cheese podcast together with Joel. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today. Before I toss it over to my guests, a big sort of um, update. Um, it's today, I have changed um, the coping eye format for this event instead of the provocations that I usually ask my guests to bring. Um, I am flipping the script and I have invited Dr. Juna to be my co-moderator and interviewer and we will actually grill um, uh, Joel and Chad today about AI and recruiting. However, we are not forgetting about the audience. Please put your questions into the Q&A box at the top right. We will be collecting those and start to ask those to sort of halfway through the conversation. Now, enough for me. I am handing it over to Dr. Ajunwa, who will set the scene for us. Uh, Ifoma, AI and deployment in 2023. What does that look like? <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, first and foremost, Mona, for the um, invite. Um, I'm, I'm glad to have this opportunity to chat with uh, Joel and Chad and yourself about AI in HR. 
Um, what does uh, AI in HR or recruiting look like? Um, slightly bleak <laughs> is probably my answer. So um, as you mentioned, I have a forthcoming book uh, titled The Quantified Worker. Um, as the title suggests, I do take kind of a critical view um, to the role of AI in the workplace. And one of my chapters, actually two of my chapters is devoted to automated hiring and the role that AI plays in that, um, be it in terms of sorting um, applicants through um, ATS applicant tracking systems or through um, the use of automated video interviewing um, and what sort of like pseudoscience can come from that. Um, so, you know, with the book, I'm, I'm really very interested in the role that AI is already playing uh, in the workplace, um, which I think is somewhat getting subsumed by the conversation around, you know, chat GPT, DALI, all this generative AI, right? That's supposedly going to put workers out of work and just take over the workplace. Um, and then unbeknownst to us, we've already had, you know, AI, I, I, to be quite frank, I don't like the term AI. I actually prefer the, the term automated decision making because that's what really these things are. Um, but we already have automated decision making in the workplace long before chat GPT um, and any of those generative AI. Um, currently, we have automated hiring systems that are actually um, very actively affecting workers' lives. Um, and this is uh, impacting, uh, you know, who's considered a candidate for recruiters. It is impacting um, how the candidate experiences the hiring process, even just, you know, putting in your application. You basically have to run the gauntlet of um, automated hiring al algorithms that may be looking for certain keywords or maybe, you um, designed to eliminate candidates based on gaps in employment and other things like that, that might actually have a discriminatory impact um, on workers. So I write ab about that in the book. So please pick up the book, The Quantified Worker, coming out soon, uh, available for pre-order. Um, but I think what I really want to talk about with, with Joel and Chad is what trends that they're seeing um, with yes. AI and HR, right? Ignoring the well, not totally ignoring, but, you know, getting past the chat GPT hype, you know, getting past all the generative AI, putting people out of work. What is um, AI doing currently in the recruitment space? Well, first, I want to thank uh, Mona for having us on. And I, I particularly want to thank Tenure, because without Tenure, I'm not sure a couple of clowns like us would be on a on a podcast or a webinar like this. So I want to thank... <laughs> <laughs> thank Tenure and thank Mona uh, for having us on. And I think before uh, we talk about current state and where we're going, which is very important, I think it's important also to look back a little bit at the history of, of AI. And uh, in our intros, everyone knows that Chad and I are pretty old. And when Chad and I first got into the business world, you literally sent a, 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 re a paper resume with a paper cover letter to an employer. In that world, it's very hard to apply to many, many jobs. The internet changed that. The internet enabled people to shotgun their resume to literally thousands of employers. And when that happened, employers were like, oh, hell, how do we control the flow of all these resumes? And the early days of filtering that was like pre-screening questions. It could be as easy as, are you 18 or over? Uh, could you have a driver's license? Like, the filtering started pretty simple uh, in simple format, and it was not uh, generally not discriminatory against uh, race and age and things like that. As technology evolved and we got away more from posting a job online, it became finding people online. And we can thank LinkedIn and others for that. So uh, in addition to posting jobs, recruiters were then, okay, find people. And then services came out that tried to match these people that are online with jobs that are online. And the early iterations of that, as Chad and I know, were really, really bad um, and didn't really work very well. So technology evolved, databases of people, how do you search them? How do you find them? All these things have evolved into what it is today and what we're talking about today. But it's also important, to, I think, to highlight that there's no conspiracy to like screw over people in this process. These are engineers that sit in a room and go, wouldn't it be cool if we could like 
look at someone's face and how they answer questions and are they more likely to be lying about this than otherwise there was no like you know conspiracy to screw over uh people of diversity and and diverse candidates but it's kind of turned into that unfortunately and i think that's what we're talking about today but i I wanted to, to kind of set the table historically with how this thing was sort of born and it's become a bit of a frankenstein's monster that we're trying to figure out okay how do we fix this government's involved <laughs> employers are involved there's a lot of fear and uncertainty and doubt in this and hopefully we can we can set some of that fear uncertainty and doubt to rest as we we talk about some of these issues but that's sort of my take on the current state of things looking at the past to explain the current day and future well and and a couple of things joel was talking about that's all scale right and i mean that's that's what we're going to be talking about today but that's scale when you could when you had to actually mail or you couldn't email at the time you faxed right you faxed in your your, your resume you care hand carried it in well imagine that day versus the next day when you got flooded with hundreds of resumes well what happened most of those went into a black hole because recruiters didn't have time to get to them because they did they couldn't scale right so th- that's that that's the big that's that's the big change now what we didn't ask then what we should ask now is what Joel was alluding to with regard to facial recognition and all those things is is not can we it's should we should we actually go that way and in talking about bias the, the history of bias is, is rooted in humanity not ai the difference is scaling bias humans don't scale well the best that we can scale is through training right we can train people to be biased and then you have armies of people going out to be biased but ai scales in an instant so some of the best and most powerful systems can carry bias and if we don't pay attention to the outcomes and, and, and feverishly audit the algorithms, we're going to have bias. Regulations do not distinguish between human and AI bias. Bias is bias. It's just that bias can scale much faster w- with AI. That's where we need to focus, where we're hearing all these glitz and glamour things about chat GPT, which I think is demonstrating that we're getting closer to the promise of of AI than all this vaporware we've been talking about for years. But then we talk about, and and, and we know history from uh, Amazon building an algorithm. The, this is the, can we, yes, they can. They should have asked, should we? And they shouldn't because they automatically failed sourcing and hiring experiments uh by knocking out females why because they were feeding the algorithm the the machine they were training it on data that was what it was biased that was human behavioral bias and what happened the machine spit out bias so as we start to have these conversations it's the can we should we but it's also understanding that we have to innovate so as we innovate we also need strong regulatory uh, entities to ensure that the enforcement and the standards are clear, which we, we just don't have today. Yeah, that's, I think that's such a great, so many great points, Chad, um, you know, and, you know, also to go back to Joel's point first about thinking about the historical development of automated hiring. Um, it's it's funny that you brought that up because uh, a co-author and I actually research how did automated hiring come about? How was it even advertised when it first came out such that companies could take it on? And it was this idea that a lot of it was trying to find talent away from your geographical location. And it was actually the advent of um, software development that um, drove a lot of automated hiring development, which is that we need you know, a software developer we don't necessarily have them all concentrated in Silicon Valley like you have now. Let's find them wherever they are. And first, you know, people would mail in their resumes on like a CD-ROM, right? Uh, you know, they would do all their like, you know, little coding tests on a CD-ROM and send that in. And that was like, okay, that's not so efficient. What if we had a centralized sort of thing now that we have the internet, right? Where people can just access it from anywhere and do that. Um, and then when the first automated hiring programs are being developed, to go to Chad's point, one of the 
slogans, right? One of the advertising slogans was clone your best worker, right? So just, just sit and think about that slogan, clone mm -hmm. your best worker. So automated hiring programs were never really meant to diversify the workplace, right? Which is somewhat how they sort of viewed now or used now by a lot of corporations. They were really meant to replicate exactly what you already had. So you take your best, best worker and you clone them. So if you think about historical bias, right? Historical human bias, such as workplaces where women have been shut out, right? Workplaces where there are not really a lot of minorities. When you have an automated hiring program then, what you're doing is not so much eliminating the bias, right? As Chad mentioned, but you're actually exacerbating it because then you're just basically trying to clone your best workers. So unless you're very careful and thoughtful and deliberate, um, an automated hiring program is just going to come in and replicate bias and do it at scale. That's also important as Chad mentioned, right? Because as I mentioned in my book, one biased human manager can maybe affect, you know, I don't know, thousands of resumes in their tenure as, you know, a recruiter or a manager, but a program, right, that's written in a way that's biased or trained in a way that results in, you know, bias getting encoded in can impact millions of people, right? It can impact millions of people. Um, so I think, you know, as you, as you touch on chat, it's just so important to start thinking about regulations. Um, thus far, I feel that automated hiring has been really a wild, wild west. It's really, anybody can create an automated hiring program, and we've seen this, right? I think, I know you've seen this in industry and just make claims about what this automated hiring program can do. And a lot of the claims are about, oh, you'll just find you more diverse workers. Oh, it will just create, you know, um, all these avenues of talent for you, right? A lot of it is snake oil, right? Um, and the question is, why is that, why is that allowed to exist? Why do we not have regulations um, to curb, uh, you know, misuse of automated hiring? Acknowledging, right, that it can have its uses, like Joe mentioned before, it can allow for this efficiency in finding talent, efficiency in applying, right, efficiency for the applicant, but we need regulations. So my next question for you guys is, I mean, I have, I have my thoughts on what regulations should be in place, but as industry players, what are your thoughts about what in regulations we need? So, I mean, any vendor that says that their tech is compliant and not biased should, shouldn't be trusted right out of the gate because it's not the tech that's biased. I think, I think we've, we've, we've already established that. It's the humans driving the tech, meaning the developers, perspectively, on the, on the, the vendor side, but also the hiring companies. So, this, as we take a look at regulations today, it's focused on outcomes, right? So we, and I don't think that changes. We, we, have to, we have to take a look at outcomes, but again, we're scaling outcomes differently than we did just, just five, 10 years ago. So being able to take a look at the frameworks that we currently have, because know that we know that government doesn't, doesn't move as fast as technology and or business, that we can take some of those frameworks that already exist and, and they work, and we just need to enforce them. Now, being able to move past that to, you know, some of the regulations uh, and, and standards around uh, auditing, like in, in New York City, uh, you know, I, I believe their move forward is smart. Uh, it, it sends a signal, it sends a message, uh, but they are going to have to work toward ensuring that there are frameworks and standards in place so that companies aren't throwing their hands up in the air saying, well, I don't know what to do. They, they, they do need direction. There's no question. Although the direction right now is current regulation and outcomes. I think ultimately there are going to be some features that are, that are going to have to be outlawed. Um, I think automation with video, I don't know how that gets like rubber stamped approved. Like there, there are so many pitfalls in that. So something like that, I could see like your, your technology cannot do that. Now, um, other things like with people with disabilities that can't, you know, speak in a more fluid manner, like things that are gaps in speech can't be a feature that eliminates someone from getting to the next level of an interview. So to me, it's like, ultimately, certain features of the tech 
that pre-screen or get someone to the actual human being uh, interview are going to have to be outlawed. Many things in, in automation are great. Uh, you know, I, I have a 16 year old son that, that just got his first job. And I can tell you that applying through McDonald's with a conversational chat bot versus sending in a paper resume at your local subway, the McDonald's experience is far better. Uh, and, and there was no, in terms of bias, it's like you've passed the main, the main stuff, we'll schedule an interview, you can manage all that with automation, that's great. But I think a lot of these core things that discriminate are going to have to be uh, illegal, outlawed, and vendors won't be able to create those features, and employers won't be able to leverage those features going forward. I think uh, we're seeing that a little bit on the local level, uh, state level. Illinois has a great case uh, with facial recognition, a company called HireView that a lot of people know. Um, so these things are coming out at a state and local level, but eventually on a federal level, uh, these things are going to have to come into play. I think a real challenge, though, uh, is everyone's work from home. It's a global workplace. We're hiring people everywhere. And then that creates a contractor versus an employee situation. So are there are there loopholes around this or where you hire? So, again, it, it becomes really complicated. But here in the U.S., I think there's going to have to be a, a, an effort to say, look, these features, we're not we're not going to stand for it because they're discriminatory. Yeah, um, I I so wholeheartedly agree. I'm I'm so glad you brought up the video interviewing uh, issue. Um, you know, that's also something I, I write about in the book and in my research for that. What I noted, you know, in speaking with people who had been subjected to it, was just the great potential for um, accent discrimination. Um, the great potential for the use of pseudoscience where supposedly algorithms are able to accurately determine somebody's emotion or even determine somebody's like trustworthiness or if they're lying, um, just is just rife with um, all kinds of potential abuses and known abuses. So I just think that video interviewing, especially when purporting, to read emotion or do facial analysis that it just has to be banned. Mm -hmm. um, but this also brings me to a point that Chad made, which is this idea of um, post, like, you know, so in my book, I talk about ex ante versus ex post regulations, right? And so, you know, Ch Chad touched upon like audits, right? As a type of ex post regulation, which is looking at outcomes, right? And seeing, are these outcomes good? Are these out outcomes something we want? And if they're not, um, you know, we need to change them or we need to change how we got to them. So that seems like it's very exposed where you, you've already launched the automated hiring. But I also want to push upon, like, we shouldn't forget X anti-regulations, right? And outright banning, right, is an ex-anti-regulation. It's like, we just know that's bad. We're just going to ban that. We're not going to try to do an audit. We're just not going to do automated video interviewing. But should we also be thinking about ex-anti-regulation in the form of design features? So for example, one design feature that I'm proposing and I'm you know trying to push the EOC to mandate is the idea that you actually keep a record. So right now, automated hiring programs are not required to keep a record of all the applications, whether they pass you know, through to be interviewed by an interviewer or not, a human interviewer, and even the interview attempts. So I actually think we might need an ex ante regulation, which is the design of the automated hiring has to allow or actually mandate record keeping where every person that applies does a record of that and even failed applications because with the research I was doing, I was finding that some automated hiring platforms, they were actually preventing people from completing the application. So they were already calling people even before they could complete the application. So just to give you an example of that, I know it's hard to imagine I try to, you know, as part of my research, fill out an application for a major retailer whom I won't mention because I don't want to get sued. Uh, <laughs> but this is a think major, huge, you know, clothes, groceries, everything in one place kind of retailer, right? 
And in the application, I, you know, pretended to be different types of people. And one type of person was somebody who has a limited amount of time to work per day. So somebody that could fit the profile of say a, a stay at home mother most of the time, like somebody that would need to pick up their kids from school at 12, you know, 2.30 or three. Mm -hmm. So I put my availability from nine to two. Well, I found I could not actually complete the application, even though I had checked that I was applying for a part-time position, right? And my availability was certainly enough for a part-time position. I could not actually complete the application. The application just would not refresh till the next page until I checked that I had unlimited availability. Okay, so the, the question around that is, is that, is, that a, is that a technical issue from the vendor standpoint or is that a, a, right. a, corporate, a corporate issue, right? Because right. the company could be dictating that. So there's, there, there's, exactly. a, separ there's a separation between vendor and, and process, right? right? And, and, and um, standard operating But But, but the program is allowing that, right? The program has to be programmed to allow that. Right? Yeah. So yeah. should we have basically design mandates? Like you can't do certain X types of programs. Do you see what I'm saying? So whether it's a, you know, corporation mandating it or the vendor, mm -hmm. if the vendor says we can't actually legally de design that for you, right? Mm -hmm. you well, see, yeah. The qu the question for me is, I mean, yeah. so so first and foremost, that's what that's what audits are for. And that's what mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. that's what standards are for. So being able to 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 actually point out where they're going awry with regard to standards, and you can't apply because at that point you don't become a candidate. You don't become a candidate, then you're not in the audit. You're not in the talent pool, right? That's a step yeah. that you needed to take to be able to actually be quote unquote part of the record keeping process. So they were stopping that. I don't think that yeah. is the 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 vendors. Uh, fault number one. Uh, I think you know it's the difference between adding seatbelts to a car and allowing uh, somebody to uh, to to actually take a left or a right, whether they're taking the wrong directions or not. Right. So we have to be careful around what mm -hmm. we actually dictate vendors to do. Is that their responsibility or is that the responsibility of an organization who could be following, you know, EEOC or OFCCP being being a, being a government mm -hmm. contractor rule? So I think personally, from my standpoint, being in the OFCCP space for, for a very long time, you know, I, it, that's on the employer. Now, are there some aspects where the, um, the vendor should definitely stay away, much like the higher view instance. Yes, I, I think again, that's the that's the the the, the can we should we kind of uh, of conversations, and that's pretty much where Illinois they stood up, they pointed directly at higher view and said, "You're the problem." So we we need to start pointing out platforms and features and issues mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are the problem, and uh, and again do that through regulation. And at that point, I mean, nobody's going to buy it. Yeah. And, and, and we are a capitalist organization, you know, uh, country. So therefore, people are not going to buy it if it is against the law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's there's a little bit of a, a buyer beware uh, highlight here. Uh, mm -hmm. Not to pick on higher view. Oh, what the hell? Let's hit, let's pick on higher view. Um, so yeah. so higher view uh, in the last six months or so has updated their terms of service. To essentially say that, hey, employer, if something happens legally, it's your fault, not ours. You're going to see more and more vendors try to try to uh, immunize, immunize or vaccinate themselves against legal issues and put the blame on employers. So if you're an employer, make sure, you know, like the vendors you use, what kind of indemnity or, or threats or dangers might there be if they're tech is discriminatory because you're probably on the hook if their tech is discriminating against candidates that you're interviewing and hiring. And I think that was in direct response to California because California is trying to push through regulations that actually start to hold uh, the vendors responsible for yeah. so, some of these issues. So again, we're, we're seeing we're seeing some 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 play here, right? Some gamesmanship. Uh, but again, I, there, there is a, a huge buyer beware, not to mention we talk about, you know, we talk about auditing who should audit, who's credentialed to audit and who's just audit washing. I mean, we saw, I think uh, Mona actually published 
uh, a study around Pymetrics where they were audit washing. They were paying an organization to say everything was fine, everything is good. And this is, I think, before they were even acquired, which brings up some 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 some, some other issues, legal mm-hmm. issues. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, there there are many of these steps that we need to think about. We need to be incredibly intentional and thoughtful about putting frameworks and standards in place so that we don't have uh, organizations going off the rails like we've seen, vendors going off the rails and hiring companies going off the rails. Thank you for those um, contributions. I'm so glad that we kind of got to the juicy bits right away, which is regulation (laughs) and enforcement of regulation. It's what Um, we do. Yeah. So on that, on the kind of... um, capital A audit question. Um, You brought up kind of some very concrete issues um, and questions here, all three of you. Thank you for that. With colleagues from data science, journalism, and um, psychology, we actually conducted a stealth audit of two personality assessment tools that are used in the hiring space, Crystal and Humantic. And we found some instabilities in there that kind of show that these instruments are not really fit for purpose. For example, we found that one of the tools would predict a different personality type for the same person, depending on whether the resume was uploaded as raw text or as PDF, for example. So non-job relevant kind of um, elements that skewed the result here. Now, that work was extremely cumbersome. It was interdisciplinary. I think that that is definitely needed, that we kind of have a not just a purely technical approach here and end up with a statement that says, oh, we just need to make the algorithm better. But there are reasons behind the fact that some of these technologies can't work because they are snake oil, as uh, Ifoma said so that was a long process and it um was kind of a bootstrapped um project you know there isn't necessarily funding available um for that and so my big question for the two of you is who how should we actually design that whole regulation enforcement process vis-a-vis audits who is gonna pay for what for that we can all say we all need independent audits we need stealth audits but then what? Who's going to do it and who's going to pay for it? I have a shortcut. Uh, There are hundreds of thousands of government contractors that are out there today who receive hundreds of millions of billions of dollars, okay? Uh, They they can easily, if they want the government's money, which they obviously do, they uh, could definitely have to go through a, a battery of tests for the tech stack that they use. And uh, Ifoma is actually talking about the, the applicant tracking system er, earlier, which is really a relic of, of, of our past. We now work in a tech stack where there's more than just one piece, piece of tech, where before we just had an applicant tracking system. And that was our record keeping process. Today, we are much more advanced and there are some incredibly powerful systems that are out there today that are, are stacked. You know, all the way from, you know, uh, uh, programmatic outreach to, to the chatbot application process that Joel talked about, dynamic screening, screening, matching, engagement. There's so many different things that, that actually happen. What we need to do is we need to find easy ways to at least start the process. And it's very simple. I'm a taxpayer. If you want my money, you have to go through this batteries, uh, the battery of tests to be able to get those hundreds of millions and or billions of dollars of contracts, right? That to me seems like the the easiest way forward to get to get this moving. The answer, Mona and, and Chad touched on this to all of your questions is money. Um, so when you look at the problem, you know, employers are driven and technologies are created in large part because of supply and demand and features are built because employers say we want that right so if you create a system where an employer says i'm not going to buy your tech unless you've got the seal of approval from blank then that vendor is encouraged Uh, if they want to stay in business to get that badge, whatever that looks like in order to sell their product to employers. Now, does that 
badge come from a, a in government agency? I prefer it not to. I'd prefer private companies to create an audit system that is approved by the government that then they can say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna run a fine tooth comb through your tech. We're gonna do an audit that's approved by the government and we're gonna give you our seal of approval that this is this is approved by the government agency or body that we've been audited ourselves by to provide this badge. If you created an ecosystem where the employer felt confident buying from the vendor, the vendor felt confident selling it because they've been audited by an approved auditor, then you've got a winner. Now, how we get there, somebody smarter than me is going to have to figure that out. But yeah. that's, I think, the environment that you have to create for everyone to be comfortable buying and selling products and services. It's our current process now for OFCCP and distribution of jobs. It's it's our current process. We set a standard, the OFCCP has education and enforcement. Then there is a layer of what Joel talked about, these, these organizations who know what the standards are and they help the companies abide by the standards. It's, it's something that we already have in place. So it's not recreating the wheel. It's a process methodology that we already have. It's just new tech that we have to be able to, to, to credential. Yeah, I, I fully am so on board, um, you know, especially and with we're the done. idea of certification. <laughs> we're done, we're done. Um, it, it's so funny because I actually wrote a paper about this in 2020 um, about um, creating something called the Fair Automated Hiring Mark. Um, and this would be a certification. Um, and I likened it to like how, you know, you have, you know, certified green buildings. So it could be, uh, you know, like Joel mentioned, a third party, you know, certifying that these um, automated hiring programs do meet, you know, the required standards of the EEOC. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm not sure that the EOC can't get involved. It, it seems like you're very much against that, Joel. But in my paper, I'm more open-ended. It could be the EOC actually getting involved and issuing the certification, or it could be a third party. I see pros and cons either way, right? So with, with the EEOC, obviously they are a government agency. They have a lot of other things on their plate as well, right? Um, with the third party, that's a new market, right? There's going to be people who will want to, you know, enter that market and provide that service. But there's also the con of, you know, could it be, um, how shall we say, co-opted, right? Could we get, you know, certifications that are not necessarily on the up and up, right? But I, I tend to agree with you, Joel, that it is about money. So I don't think that most third-party agencies will get away. Uh, I mean, third-party, you know, certification programs would get away with certifying things that don't work because they will get found out, right, They're sooner or later. Yeah. And then, yeah, exactly. And then no one will go with, with them. So yeah. that's that's exactly what I argued in my paper. So I tend to very much agree with you. I also see that audits are part of this process. So, you know, we had talked about audits to be, as being like an, you know, ex post regulation, but I actually think it could be an ex anti regulation where you audit the, the algorithm or you audit the program before it's even launched, right? And that audit is what, is what allows it to be certified. Now, would I say that audit is enough? Would I say that's the only thing you have to do and then that's it? No. So in my paper, what I actually say is that even with the certification, the EOC should still mandate that the employer do internal audits. Um, you know, on a sort of, you know, timely basis. I don't know what the time frame for would be. That's something, you know, they can work out, but that they are required to do these regular audits mm -hmm. and also keep the results of the audits. Because then if there is a lawsuit, they would be required to provide the results of the audit. Well, let so me, that's let, my let, take on that. let me, yeah, let me hit you real quick ahead. on that one. Cause I, I don't think that being able to audit it before makes any sense because when we're talking about AI, it's all about the information, the, the algorithms trained on. So if it's trained mm -hmm. on nothing, then, I mean, you're really auditing nothing. You're auditing behavior. Again, the, the AI itself is not generally the problem. The Amazon's AI wasn't really generally the problem. It was the information mm -hmm. it was fed into it. So the machine is what it's fed. It's what it learns, right? So right, but, but there are the training. 
there are training models out there you can use. So right now there's been a big move, right? For like um, training models to be made available, um, you know, on, a, on an open source basis. Yeah. So there are lots of training data that can be used for audits. Mm -hmm. Now, will it be specific to perhaps, you know, the, the specific corporation? No, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I say that first audit can't be the, you know, be all and end all, right? The individual, uh, you know, specific corporation still has to do the, have to do the internal audits because then they're using their own specific data. But I still believe that you can audit the program before it's launched, just using all the training data that's out there, free of charge. Yeah, it's just, it, yeah. it's going to be an entirely different animal of the data that it's trained sure. against, it's right? Possible. So, so it's, it's taken us 49 minutes to get to ChatGPT. ChatGPT uh, could, could actually be an entirely different animal if it was trained sure. on uh, current data, right? So I, I understand sure. what you're saying from a basic philosophy standpoint, but to be quite frank, it can grow into uh, it, using those, those standards. Sure. Moving forward, the, the the biggest point of audit for me is after it starts eating that data. Sure, sure. But even using the Chat GPT example, not to be you know pedantic, you are seeing the problems already, right? Okay. Because what is Chat GPT right now, if not basically a huge audit, right? We're like basically everybody using Chat GPT is beta testing for them. Right, they're doing the yeah. audits for that right now. Genius. So you have Genius. all this like wide variety of data, and you're still seeing problems, different types of problems, right? Depending on who you know is interacting with ChatGPT and what type of data they're putting in, but you are seeing the genres of problems already. So I yeah. think I think that's useful. I think that's useful. Yes. Anyway. So before we go down <laughs> further, the chat GBT rabbit hole, um, just another call to the <laughs> yeah. audience that um, we'll be starting to ask some audience questions um, very soon. So um, feel free to drop them into the Q&A uh, box to the right of your screen. Um, I want to um, shift gears just a little bit and um, talk a little bit more about the HR tech industry per se. Um, we kind of, you know, have very concrete ideas about regulation, how this could be done, who should pay for it. But as people who are not in that sector, in that industry, it would be very useful to understand, like, what does that sector look like? Who is who are the players? What are the specific tools, especially the quote unquote AI driven tools that are out there? And what are the tools that recruiters really like to latch onto? Because I know there are some that they're just being mandated to use and others that they really love. Um, so maybe uh, Joel and Chet, you can give us a little bit more inside knowledge onto that whole space that is quite hidden from public view, to be honest. Hidden from public view, the dark web of recruitment. Um, so your your question is essentially what kind of tools are recruiters or employers embracing? Is that is that the question generally that you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. What, what yeah, yeah. and sort of who does what, like who and where where does the big yeah, money you know, go also? Yeah, it will, I think it would be nice to get a sense of the big players, right? Who are sort of the leaders of AI in in HR. I mean, you've mentioned HireVue, for example, which yeah, is, okay. I would say, a leader in automated video, but who are the others? So I think we talk a lot about automated recruiting and we talk about augmented recruiting. And I, I feel like the augmented stuff is, is catching on much more than the automated stuff in terms of uh, recruiters. So you've got conversational AI, okay, you know, basic questions, 24 hours a day, ask a chat bot on your phone or on whatever career site you're on, like that's embraced. Conversational AI um, is not going anywhere. Um, scheduling, automated scheduling, right? Scheduling is a pain in the butt. So if you can augment that for a recruiter, like that's going to be popular. So you have companies like GoodTime. Most, most chat bots or conversational AI solutions have scheduling as well uh, that people can control that. Um, the other one I think is, is probably like sourcing. In other words, we have a huge database of people. Here's my job. 
Now go find me people who qualify for that job. And the augmentation or the, the, the robot says, okay, here's everyone in, in this database that we think you should be talking to or recruiting. So those, those kinds of three things or anything that is a real pain in the butt or time consuming is being replaced and embraced by recruiters from my perspective. Yeah, and my, my favorite, and, and I think has the most promise, is that uh, companies today spend hundreds of millions of dollars on um, uh, recruitment marketing alone, and that's just push pushing jobs out to be able to pull people in, right? Well, then they build these candidate databases that that we call them the black hole, where candidates go, uh, and 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 they ne never hear anything. Well, they've got these amazing matching technologies that give you an opportunity to use that database that you spent all that money on to be able to draw those individuals back in to apply for like positions or positions that they could prospectively be more qualified for. So there's a lot of heavy lifting for that. That's just an invite, right? And that's something that uh, is, is a lot of heavy lifting from a data standpoint. But if you have the the behavior of the candidate and you have their their past and you know what jobs they meet the requirements for that's an easy match just to invite them back to apply for uh, another job uh there are some my favorites in and i mean we we obviously you know with the chat and cheese podcast we have we have sponsors but uh <laughs> but my favorites i mean you're talking about programmatic job distribution uh, you're talking about matching, you're talking about uh, conversational AI. So, you know, Pando Logic, Text Kernel, Talk Push, Paradox, Hire Easy, Recruitix, uh, Recruitology. I mean, ZipRecruiter has had a, 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 you know, a hard time over the years, but they really focused heavily on AI before it was cool. And they had a whole AI center in Israel. So the, the, the thing that I think that ChatGBT has, has brought to us is first and foremost demonstrating that the promise of AI is finally meeting today, right? We've been seeing vaporware for years and, and vaporware is pretty much just the promise that just would never, never came true. Today, I think the promise is starting to come true with, with some of these products. Uh, and now that, that's pretty powerful. And then being able to have transparency, which ChatGPT provides. If we see more of that from our industry and in recruiting and, and outsourcing and, and all these things, then I think you know we aren't trying to look into a black box. We have more transparency and we understand what's happening and how it's a part of the process itself because to be quite frank building a tech stack for most talent acquisition professionals is is like trigonometry for goodness yeah. sakes yeah i feel it's it's a hard question to answer because there are so many providers it's not like the days where where do i post my job to make sure everyone in the u.s can get it like we'll go to monster go to career, career builder mm -hmm. i mean your best your best tool is either a, a really good agency a recruitment ad agency that knows these tools or go to a G2 or go to a product hunt, look at reviews, ask, ask your colleagues on LinkedIn, who they use. Um, it's really dependent upon your needs, your location, what you're hiring for. Like there are so many variables. It's a hard question to ask or answer. Uh, and Chen, I get that question all the time. Like who should we use to, to solve all of our problems? And unfortunately there's no silver bullet that we can recommend that everyone can just get on easy street uh, with their recruiting automation tools. Apropos um, silver bullet, I'm going to ask a question that I get often uh, when I'm being you know, asked about my own research on this topic, which is um, how do you trick the system as a candidate? And that's also something that, of course, is interesting for our students, if I'm just laughing, uh, we get that question, you know, how do I tweak my CV? We have this kind of urban myth of, oh, you just put the keyword words in white font on your CV and then the system picks it up and pushes you up on the ranking. So I hear kind of these myths. And then when I interview recruiters and sourcers for my research, 
they kind of categorically deny that that's even a thing and say like, absolutely not. You cannot trick the system and you cannot trick me. And I'm so curious to hear your responses to kind of that whole space, that whole question, candidates right. and AI. It, it's funny that how you much say time the, do you have the white text how yeah, much time is left it's funny it's funny you say the white text because that's like circa 1998 SEO, yeah. yeah that was i mean that was one of the things that we were doing it was all keyword search back then Meta tags it was it was all and, and we were te we, i mean we were actually teaching um we were teaching employers how to html some of those keywords at the bottom of their job descriptions as well so that they would rank higher so i mean it was happening on both sides and it will continue to happen on both sides so the the gaming and we talk about ghosting and how you know uh candidates ghost employers well they ghost employers because employers ghosted them first right it's it's a learned behavior so i think for for me the the one that's that, that's hardest for me to believe is is you know the, the the psycho babble that happens out there and all these pseudo science sciences which you know i call psycho babble in most cases because i can go through and answer questions differently as i think they want me to answer them to to try to trick the system into what i think they want versus who i really am right and and not to mention i mean if you take a look at a lot of the data that's out there, uh, you know, females won't apply for jobs unless they are more qualified, 100% qualified or even more versus men who could be like 20% qualified and we don't care. It's like, ah, I can do the job, right? So it's like, how do you, that's almost like tricking the system itself. I see what the requirements are, but I'm going to go ahead and just push past that. And, and, and click on apply because yeah. I think I'm qualified for the job, whether they think I am or not. So it's been happening. And as Joel has said, there are so many different ways for a candidate to trick the system, but there's also even more ways for the employers to trick the system. Uh, I love this question because we talk so much about employment tools that are automated. The job seekers have automated tools too, uh, but to get to get to the tricking your resume question, yes, those white you know white text on white background, that's really that's don't do that. However, there are some really sound SEO strategies that you should still be using, like a good title, a good you know like a structure, like this is for real. Robots that are that are scraping your resume are dumb. Make it easy as hell for a robot to read your resume. So like go to Google Docs or wherever, like get the most basic formatted resume and use that as your resume. Don't get fancy with columns or images or oh, graphs or that'll just break like it. straight text, man. Make it as simple, like imagine a robot is reading your resume, make it as easy as possible to get your content. Now back to some of the other stuff that you were talking about. Um, we had a story that we talked about on our podcast recently about an agency um, an ad agency who uh, vetted candidates for a job, a copywriter. And the copywriter answered every question with chat GPT. So they actually didn't even answer on their own. They answered through chat GPT and they actually got through to the final round of interviews by using chat GPT. And then of course they were sort of like, Hey, I, this was an experiment. Um, but employers need to be aware that job seekers are going to get really good at applying to a lot of jobs as if they're a human being going through the automated interviewing process. Um, and how do you police that? How do you really uh, cut through the best candidates if they're all using a nat you know, natural language processor to answer your interview questions? Like, it, it sounds like a sci-fi movie, but we're basically almost at a point where robots are interviewing robots uh, to figure out who actually gets to speak to each other face to face. And that does nobody any good uh, because it's not really who they are. So it's getting a little bit weird out there. We'll see how it how it you know shakes out. But the job seeker side of this equation is real. And it's it's something that we need to be aware of in these well, automated and, tools. And Mona, for, from the the experiment that that uh, you talked about earlier, where a PDF versus Word documents, some parsers will get broken with PDF documents. Yeah. So therefore, you will get different results if you're using a PDF versus Word. 
so I mean that, that that's that's happening and it has been happening. Most of, most of the, the the more advanced parsers don't have that issue, but uh, not all. Yeah, text text only, baby. Text only, which is really interesting because it it is really the talking with the machine and to the machine, right? And and yeah. sort of how do we well, how do we trick the machine so we can get around it quicker so we can actually talk to a human whether that's you're, actually a recruiter you're not really, tr you're not really tricking it like i don't like the word trick i like the word optimize like you're making it as easy for a robot to read your resume index it and then make it searchable scannable um um bring it together with whether algorithms are sourcing that candidate um, I think the word trick is, is, an, is not a good word. I know English isn't your first language, uh, but like <laughs> optimization or standards, I think are better than like teaching people how to trick well, the robots. Well, in, in, yeah. tech, in tech be, is like a three-year-old at this point. Yeah. Tech is like yeah. a three-year-old at this point. You're, 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 you're doing baby talk to it versus oh, yeah. trying to, trying to use PhD level, uh, oh, you yeah. know, uh, <laughs> some of this, some of this shit. I don't know if I can cuss or not on this webinar, but some of the <laughs> stuff um, is homemade. Like the, some of these recruiters are like hackers and, you know, self-taught programmers and they're making up their own stuff. So like that's super simple. So yeah, make, make sure your resume is as simple as possible, kids. Be good data. Um, I want to take the last 10 <laughs> minutes that we have together to bring in the audience who have been extremely active actually in the Q&A. We have a ton of questions. So I'm going to um, throw specific questions to one of you. So um, I'm going to start with, with one that I find really interesting. Um, Ushnusha actually says that focus has been on AI and hiring, but should we pay more attention to AI in the firing process? Ifoma, I think that one is for you. Yeah, so uh, I'm so glad somebody asked that. Actually, I I have been looking at that and been thinking to write a paper on that. Um, here is the problem from a legal standpoint. Um, you have more recourses um, when you are not hired and you should have been hired than when you've already been hired and then fired as long as you were not fired for a, an explicitly discriminatory reason. Um, so just to simplify that, most of the US is um, you know, um, employment at will. So it means you can be fired for any reason, as long as it's not about your race, your gender, you know, your religion, right? So it's a little more tricky for workers to basically have recourse when they are fired by algorithm as I'm, I'm call, I come calling my paper firing by algorithm. So, so it's really comes down to, well, okay, like maybe you're not gonna be able to get your job back if you're fired by algorithm, but should there still be some sort of regulation about treating humans that way, right? Um, do humans deserve um, some sort of explanation, some sort of human contact when they're getting fired. Um, I think so, <laughs> right? Uh, but I'm also not a CEO of a major corporation with, you know, thousands of workers. Um, so I, I'd love to hear from you industry people, like how, what do you feel about this, you know, <laughs> trend towards firing people by algorithm mm -hmm. as we've seen so many companies doing now, whether it's algorithm or just, you know, an email or some people got an automated text um, that they were fired. Sure. What do you I, think of this trend? I, I think- Joel, Joel, you can take that and then we'll, we'll move on to the next uh, questions because we have a, a whole bunch. Oh, yeah, I'll take that one. Um, so I think it, I think some of it's country specific. I think, you know, I, I, the thing I say on the podcast is this is America, Jack, and we're really good at firing people. There was a time where that was really taboo. Uh, I think we're getting away from that. I think getting fired via email, getting fired via text, we're just becoming either numb to it or we just accept it. Now, country by country, that's going to be different. But in terms of America, um, I think it's going to happen. Look, again, to chat GPT, uh, we did a show the, uh, the, other, the other day about the black hole and not getting a, you know, thanks, but we've moved on to another candidate, right? So you can go to chat GPT today and say, Hey, write a uh, write a letter to a candidate uh, who didn't get the job, saying you're sorry, blah blah blah, for this job description. And ChatGPT will will create a really nice little form letter 
that could go out automatically to these candidates. And that can also happen with employees. So you could really easily create a natural language processing uh, strategy where letters go out to people that sound really nice and sound really human-esque um, to let people go. So I think, yes, it's it's the future, whether you like it or not. Corporate America doesn't give a shit. Uh, that's the way that it's going to go because, again, it's efficient. You don't have to have the, the uncomfortable conversation face-to-face -face about thanks for playing, but we're moving on. Um, that it's going to be automated as well. And people will just take it like most of the things that they take in the workforce. Thank you for that. I think we should have a whole co-opting on that, on that one. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe, maybe later in the semester, um, I'm going to move us on and I'm going to combine two questions, um, from Sig Silberman and Heather Moffat. And so, um, Six is saying that in, in, it sounds like in five to 10 years, we should be expected to see a lot of technical standards from bodies such as ISO, ANSI, NIST, IEEE to become important in this space. So question is, is that plausible? And I'm going to tag on Heather's question, um, who is asking what if there was a sample data set that could be used by this standards body, wouldn't companies feel more confident? running through this to ensure a no adverse impact prior to launch uh, and help um, with the adoption of these technologies. Chat, this one's for you. <laughs> yeah, I think it's good because I don't have enough degrees to any, even understand that question. Any any organization that 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 has standing, yes, that would be that would be wonderful. We're in the wild west right now, right? So I think I think the 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 best we can do is start to create standards around regulations that we're trying to press as it is. We have laws that are on the books that are already supposed to be in play, you know, like in New York City that we've got to wait now till April. Uh, again, these are signals and companies should be taking these signals, but also the vendors who already do compliance audits and those types of things should also be taking these signals in building their 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 own somewhat standards and, and working with local state and federal governments to be able to apply them if they have you know i triple e or what have you to, to 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 back them that is that is wonderful i think those types of partnerships make sense thank you for that um i'm going to combine a couple of questions um on sort of audits and i know foma has sort of one she wanted to tag on here as well so Jihao Chen, um, who I, I'm glad to see in the audience, um, is saying um, that all of you brought up the ex ante auditing as possible re uh, requirement for employment AI. Um, those are not only possible, but exist in other verticals, such as consumer finance. But one key difference is that employment AI are decision support tools and not usually used in full autonomous business processes. And so he's curious to hear what you think about how AI to aid decisions should be regulated differently from autonomous decision making AI. Um, and then we have um, another question from Nilesh who is saying, well, in sourcing, um, there perhaps also is bias in other parts of the process um, in sourcing firms are reaching out to candidates on LinkedIn who worked at major consulting firms and went to Ivy League schools. So isn't the process already biased? And so that is part of the AI auditing um, question. And then if FOMA, I know you have one about sort of addressing that via the contract or idea that chat um, articulated earlier. So I'm going to toss it to you and you can decide who gets to answer these three questions. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I think this is for Chad, um, you know, and definitely Joe can jump in, of course. Um, but yeah, you know, Chad, you, you actually touched on a subject that I perked up immediately because it's been something I've written and, you know, think about, which is the fact that federal contractors, right, have these higher standards imposed on them for, you know, ma making sure they have, frankly, a diverse workforce, right? Um, and you know, in terms of in terms of including disabled workers, also for example, mm -hmm. um, that corp you know corporations don't have. And you mentioned that this could be kind of a start, right, for regulations and maybe for audits. Um, and I just wanted you to touch ab about that on that a little bit more because I think 
we're still sort of struggling with the idea of what would be a meaningful audit. What would it actually look like? So for other industries like the financial industries, we have Starbins Oxley that lays out, here's what your audit needs to look like, right? Mm -hmm. We now have established industries of auditors. They actually are certified auditors, right? That will come and do the audits. Um, but we don't have that yet um, in the automated hiring space. So let's say starting with the contractors, right? Which I think is a good low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. What would a meaningful audit look like? Well, first and foremost, there is a robust set of uh, contractors and advisors in that space. Uh, so if they're not already uh, putting together uh, solutions for this, I would be surprised. Uh, because uh, obviously, you know, when, when you're talking about OFCCP, you're talking about, you know, 503 with uh, individuals with disabilities, you're talking about VEVRA, veterans hiring, you're talking about the whole scale of, you know, diversity and, and things that you have to do as a federal contractor. And once again, these are these are higher requirements because you are taking money from the federal government. So the federal government wants to ensure that you're meeting these higher standards. So again, I think this is very simple and could be, you know, pretty much pretty much uh, along with uh, OFCCP regulations. Uh, the thing is, they have to and this is one of the things that EEOC did not do in their in their last uh, in their last webinar. They did not bring vetter or um, vendors on. They did not bring practitioners on. They had only academia. That is that is literally a tenth of what they needed because the work happens with vendors and practitioners mainly okay academia is there for for as advisors and i think that is amazing research advice those types of things but we need to ensure that we pull the community together and we have a vehicle in which to do that and it's and, and the and the vehicle is money <laughs> and that money is is, is government contracts. So I really believe we could pull that together. Uh, and again, that, that could be a, a part of OFCCP and the current standards and outcomes that, that they have to abide by. There will be additional work that has to be done around trying to understand how these outcomes happened from the scaling of an algorithm, but you still know what the outcome is. This is not something that we don't already see because the hiring is there. The talent pool is there. All of that is, is the same. Nothing's changed. So now all we have to do is dig into the algorithm to understand where it's going wrong. Thank you for that. We are at time. So I want to ask my kind of closing question to all three of you. Joel, I'm going to start with you. Nine. Where do you see this? <laughs> yeah. Where do you see this space in five years? <laughs> This space being recruiting or the AI, AI and recruiting, AI and recruiting. Yeah, it's, and, uh, it's, it's going to happen. I, I think the, uh, you know, the, um, the guardrails, safety nets, whatever metaphor you want to use uh, are going to be put in place because there's simply too much money to be made slash saved in automating uh, the recruiting process. Even now we're seeing, you know, companies that are laying off uh, thousands of people, recruiters and HR professionals are part of those layoffs. They're not being brought back or they're being, being brought back, back as contractors more than people would thought. And most people are looking for these automated tools, these platforms to manage everything from recruiting to payroll to onboarding to offboarding. Like everyone's looking for technology to save money and, and create efficiencies around this. So it's it's going to happen. The legal s the issues around um, biases, they might not all get worked out, but they'll get worked out to a point where people aren't afraid to buy services and create new companies and sell services. Like there'll be guardrails created, uh, and this thing, this 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 space will be off to the races in terms of AI. Mm, thank you for that, Chad. Yeah, recruiting. You know also known as talent acquisition in our space is, is, is literally the beating heart of every company. No product or service is ideated, developed, sold, serviced, or customer retained, wallets opened without the actual talent that is acquired 
through recruiting. It doesn't exist. So, but it's incredibly underfunded, much like Joel had said. Mm. So being underfunded means you're flooded with tasks. And many of those tasks can be carried out by, you know, uh, robotic process automation or AI. Those tasks, I think within the next five years, at least 70% of those tasks, we will see more augmented recruiters where 70% of their tasks are actually part of RPA or AI. And then those individuals, depending on the organization and their care for the candidates, will, will actually use their people to be more human. Today, recruiters can't be as human because they're doing all these stupid little tasks. Mm -hmm. If you give them their time back so that they can actually give it to the candidates and they can be more human, then we can put the, the, the human back in human resources. Mm -hmm. By the way, imagine, great, imagine, imagine a world funny. where uh, you apply to a job at uh, Tesla and Elon Musk is actually the one interviewing you on your, on your screen for a I, job I at up. Tesla. I, I mean, hang up. Yes. Politics aside, however you feel about <laughs> Elon, but like we're going to a world where video of a human and an actual human, you can't really tell the difference. Uh, and Elon will speak different languages based on where you're, where you're located in the world. Um, this is, this is the, where we're going. Five years is a long time with the, how fast the tech is going. I think uh, you'll be you'll be gobsmacked by what it looks like. I'll give years. you a great example. Mm -hmm. We have, we have a podcast that we put out in English and we, and we have had our voices cloned Joel's voice and my voice cloned. It is now also in four other language, German, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. The AI has translated and cloned our voices in those different languages. Yeah, all it needs is the text. I will, I will, I will audit the German one. Um, but I'm gonna <laughs> toss it out. I'm gonna toss it exactly. over to Foma for the last word before I close it off for a little over time already. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I really can't add too much more. Just to say that I I do concur with this idea of a move towards more augmented decision making, um, rather than really some sort of a wholesale like transition to AI. Um, so I guess I'm to be more colloquial, I see like basically half of the people that have been fired, right, in in favor of GPT, they're gonna be hired back essentially. Um, because then we're we're gonna realize that it's not the same. We still need the humans. So yes, I will I do think there will be more, you know, helper AI, more sort of augmenting and also um, making more efficient the sort of, you know, mundane tasks, but we're still gonna need that human decision-making at the final say. So that's it from me. But yeah, it was such a pleasure uh, chatting with everyone. Thank you. Um, I hope this you do this fun. again. Thank you we so much, Ivoma, for that. Yes, we shall. So um, I'm gonna close this off. There are a ton of more really intriguing and extremely important questions in the Q&A. For example, Miguel Calderon, who I'm also glad to see here is asking about uh, personality assessments. We have a great question from Lisa Albert uh, around the use of AI in the internal employee um, promotion and assessment process. There are many more. Um, dear audience members, you can find the three uh, uh, guests online. Um, you can find uh, Chad and Joel at chatcheese.com and their podcast is on every uh, podcast platform where you get your podcasts from. Um, and Ifoma Ajunwa is at ifomaajunwa.com. You already have the link to her forthcoming book, which I very much look forward to. And with that, we are out. Tune in again for the next co-opting, which will be on the pipeline problem uh, in recruiting and the tech sector. It was such a pleasure to have you here. I very much enjoyed this conversation and this uh, format. Thank you for bringing your energy and expertise, and I will see you all soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.